Okay, so it is now one o'clock. So hopefully we are um, live with you on YouTube. Um, thank you very much to anyone who is joining us live today. That's really much appreciated. Um, but the stream, of course, will be up uh, on YouTube for anyone to watch back at a later date. Um, so welcome everyone to this uh, Greater Manchester Hate Crime Awareness Week event for Berry. Um, I am just going to start off by passing you over to Councillor Jane Black, who is going to give a little introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jane Black. I'm a councillor with responsibility for culture and the cultural economy in Bury, which we believe are very linked together. I want to welcome you all to this event, which is taking place during Hate Crime Awareness Week. I'm very sorry I'm not going to be able to stay long um, because I've got to take my mother to a medical appointment, but I will be watching the session later. Bury is, is a town and a borough with diverse communities and different interest groups of all kinds. And this council has a good track record of tackling hate crime in a number of different ways. But we and all of us can do more. And I think we do the best work when we work together. We welcome the commitment and the lead taken by the Met and by the partners on this call and other partners in organising this event. We will hear from you all today about the impact of hate crime and discrimination and how people can work together to help prevent it. So I wish you all a good session. I'm sorry I have to rush away. I'll hand you back to Steph. Thank you so much. What a brilliant introduction gives a really uh, nice bit of context to the work that, that we've been doing as part of our group. So thanks very, very much indeed uh, to Councillor Black for, for joining us. So um, this event has come about as a result of um, the meeting of a group of organisations in Bury under the banner of the Creative Case for Diversity group. This group's been sitting since uh, September of last year and we gather together on a regular basis to discuss how arts and cultural projects can help to support diversity, accessibility and inclusion in Bury. Coming together to discuss hate crime and how we can use our collective knowledge and expertise to help fight it is just one of the project ideas and discussion points that we've been developing since the inception of this group. This event and the associated programme that we're going to be talking about a little bit towards the end of the session has come about as a result of uh, some funding that we were very grateful to receive from the hate crime awareness pot at the very beginning of this year. So this event is going to enable some of our partners and group members to share some of their knowledge around hate crime, uh, its impact on their communities and how they feel the members of the public can help to stop this from happening. So I'm going to introduce our first speaker today. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to Aisha from Berry Asian Women's Centre. Aisha, over to you. Hello everyone and thank you for having me here. I am Aisha Arif, Community Director for Berry Asian Women's Centre. We are an established charity established since 1996. Uh, empowering local disadvantaged communities for 24 years, providing free advice, support, education and training. Like, um, as Councillor Black has mentioned, Bury is very diverse and rich, it has very rich communities. And uh, being working in the community, I've um, come across and made a lot of connections with the diverse communities of Bury. As myself, I am from a South Asian background. I wear a hijab and I wear a baya, which is a long dress, um, a very, very loose, long dress. Um, I don't wear a niqab, which covers my face um, like a veil. Um, I'm clearly identified as a Muslim woman. Previously, I never used to wear a hijab. I never used to wear a niqab. I never used to wear a veil. And I used to be um, where I used to have my hair out and have very Western clothing. Um, and I never experienced any kind of hate crime. This is my personal experience. Um, 
I've come across a moment where I was coming towards the office and I decided that I'll go for a walk. And um, I passed the subway and I, as I came out of the subway, I just smiled at another person who was walking. And in return, I got some shouted at and swearing. And that kind of, you know, I smiled, but in return, I got that and I, I got a bit, you know, my adrenaline kicked in and I started walking towards the office really fast just to make sure I get there on time. And um, when I got to the office, I sat down and I started thinking, what have I done wrong here? Um, all I did was smile, which is not hurt anyone or not hurt anybody's feeling. So whether that gentleman or that person was... Um, prejudice was it prejudgmental did you know anything about me did you know all I got was just a hated instant in incident that just kind of shook me up it did have a little bit it did have a toll on me mentally straight away and I kind of felt like am I okay to go back walking now because I've come to work and I worked for four or five hours and I need to go home and I haven't got my car I need to walk back will I be still okay will that person will still be there these kind of thoughts started coming in my head but then I put myself together and I'm thinking I haven't hurt him or I've not done anything wrong towards him I can still go back but that was me I actually put myself together that four or five hours that took me just put myself together but I'm thinking about other women other people who go through this not daily weekly monthly basis how do they feel? Who's there to support them? Are they mentally strong enough to come out of this, snap out of this and start, um, you know, go, putting themselves together again and start going on, go out, have the confidence back? And that's where it made me realize that we need to have more awareness, more talking, more kind of confidence building, more support available for people who are either gone through this or going to but they are actually ready mentally prepared if anything like that happens to them like i mentioned before i put myself together but they needed more support there's not a lot of strong women out there so, some people some women who wear niqab won't go out only nobody knows why nobody knows until you ask them why don't you go out you're wearing a niqab is there something bothering you do you have confidence issue do you have um, low self-esteem is it some what are the main reason and if you do go out because I did used to go for a walk with the lady and she used to go out and we used to get these comments all the time on the walks and I said to her so don't worry about it let's go out let's have a walk it's very important for you and for your health so communities that I serve I look at it as the, the main common factors that affect or that brings on the hate crime for them is the clothes they wear because they're easily identified. Secondly, obviously, the skin colour, so they get easily identified as well. And the accent, because obviously they're not born and brought up here, so their accents are completely different. And we're, we're, we're straight away go into a judgmental think that, you know, either they're not educated or they've come from background, they've, they've got no proper jobs and stuff like that. So because these factors are there without looking into it, we make judgments about these people and we start, you know, making thoughts and making thinking, oh, well, they won't be good for work. We don't even know that. If they take a job on, people still be prejudiced, thinking, English is not their first language. They will never be able to do this job properly. But they don't really understand what they're able to do, what their abilities or skills are until you know them. The appearances are not always, you know, um, there to show what kind of abilities the other person have. We should all have kindness in our heart. And kindness is, if you have kindness in your heart, you are the most beautiful person in the world. And, and, on a positive note from here, um, I must say we should know each other better. We learn about each other. We're all human. We have more in common than differences. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Aisha. I think those um, those positive words to finish off on are really important, um, along with the the rest of that that really important insight. Um, so thank you very much, and I think keeping kindness in your heart uh, to be the most beautiful person is the the a, a really lovely message. So thank you so much to Aisha. I'm going to pass us over now um, to our next speaker, who is Robert Quayle, who is here today representing Communicate. Over to you, Robert. Hi. My first time at the Berry Deaf Centre, which is called Communicate Berry, Berry now, was 35, six years ago when I came with two deaf little girls. And that's when I started volunteering at the Deaf Centre in Berry. Uh, 16, year, 16 years ago, the um, council, um, we approached them to get a part-time manager. So I've been a part-time manager for the last 16 years with voluntary work on top as well. So it can be hard work. And I'm a hearing aid user as, as well. So I do lip speak and I use British Sign Language. Um, what I'm speaking about today is about hate crime. Uh, what form does hate crime against the community often take? With the BFL users, they get a lot of, um, sadly, this area in their lives in the public places. Um, sometimes the clients, I do go out for a drink with them. There's one particular place we went to. I'm using British Sign Language. Um, after about 20 minutes, just a few tables away, there's a couple of men mimicking our sign language. And I noticed my client was getting quite upset about it. So we just drank up and left. So he said he's been to quite a few places, happens to him, and he doesn't go to those places anymore. But I said, really, you should tell the landlord because it is a form of hate crime and he's got to do something about it. Otherwise, it could cause a problem to his license. So that's a, example one. Um, people struggle with maths today. They can't lip read. So part of listening, uh, lip reading, gestures, mind, body language, makes that 100% of connecting with people when you've got a hearing issue. So one day he went to dentist and the dentist always wear a mask, wears a face shield. He said something. So my friend went to college, had a very hot drink and all of a sudden his throat started to swell. So he saw the first aid and the first aid said A&E straight away. And they told A&E the story. They said, the dentist must have told you not to drink hot, a, a drink hot drink after the dental treatment because he'd numbed his mouth, which affected his throat as well. So this is what deaf people miss out when people have got a mask on, they can't hear what they say. So there's a lot of confusion out there for deaf people. Um, question two, what other forms of discrimination? Uh, we, uh, we can share example one. We do get a lot of BSL interpreters getting appointments the various departments in the borough and they always want a BSL interpreter because by law the, the department's got to provide a BSL interpreter and quite often I've got to ring those departments where the BSL user has appointment and book a BSL interpreter. Some departments are not aware of this, I've got to tell them about it. Sometimes I have to provide a BSL interpreter details um, they, they'll book one eventually. So the deaf person uses BSL, go to his appointment. He, he's got a BSL interpreter there to act the go-between him and the doctor, and he knows what's going on. And he's got a right to say no or yes to what has been said to him. Um, example two, one chap, he's got a flat, he rents in Berry. The landlord came in and said, we're going to do some refurbishment. And he's like, what, what, what's going on? So he showed him some drawings. And he was getting all frustrated. The BSL interpreter didn't know what was going on. So he came to the deaf centre to communicate. 
And before we spoke, he's just got the paperwork which has been given to him and ripped them all up. And he said, I don't want them in my property. So I said, it's the landlord's interest to make the place more comfortable for you as well as better for them. So when I ran the receptionist of that organisation, she said, oh, he's got to be told. So I said, could I make arrangements with the manager? manager? So I made arrangement with the manager and he booked a BSL interpreter, showed him how to. Um, when that arrangement was made and the client seen the BSL interpreter and the housing officer, he comes to me with all smiles and said, that's a great, great job what they're going to do in my flat. And he, he's going to accept all, all the conditions what they put forward to him. So that's some examples I've given. I'm just going through my mobile now. Um, amongst the deaf community, there are high levels of mental health, particularly for British Sign Language users. It is estimated that 40% compared to 25% of the general population. So deaf people do um, have more mental health problems. But we've got to, it's good to say there is uh, mental health organisations in both, there's two of them, and they all use British Sign Language interpreters. Um, I can give you some more difficulties deaf people have outside. Uh, one hearing aid user, she, she makes curtains, she makes soft furniture. Really hard job, really, because every job is not the same. So the measurements are different. The styles are different. And every time she meets up with the boss, she has a book and she draws it out and writes it out. But as you know, if you lip read, you can't read at the same time. It's either one or the other. So as the boss is showing in the book what to do, the person trying to lip read the boss. So it's quite nerve wracking for that person to get on with the job and not show the measurement and the styles. And she keeps going back and forward to the manager and sometimes cut the material and sometimes 40... 40 pound a square metre. So if you cut them short, you, you're in trouble. So enough is enough. So she went on sick for a month and then she found out about access to work. And then the boss couldn't get another person to replace her and they were desperate. They were desperate to get her back. So they put on shorter working hours and the conditions are better because someone in the shop has some form of deaf awareness. So now that shop worker as well as the boss and the deaf person that sells they work together so things are getting on better but she's still waiting for work through access to work which is called a roger pen so it, it's a microphone which the boss has and she puts a hearing aid on t t switch so hopefully soon that will that will arrive what can individuals do to prevent hate, prevent hate crime a lot of hate crime is caused by a lack of understanding of death and not having, gosh, sorry, not having the right interaction skills, like not having British Sign Language skills or lip reading skills, and use different communicate techniques. We can start by educating people. Communicate very do talks to groups and schools, explaining being what deaf deafness is like and help people to use British Sign Language and do lip reading. Before, um, before communicate, communicating with a deaf person that lip reads is to make sure that you position yourself face to face with the person before you commit, communicate. Then speak slowly, slowly, clearly and concisely. Please do not shout at a deaf person. It's not usually the loudness of your voice, it's the clarity. You get lots of um, deaf people, they can't, they can't make out, so shouting makes it worse. If you are changing subject, let them know. If you go from one subject to another to a deaf person, it's good to say, I'm going to change the subject now, so we're going to talk about something else. So that you will, they will know you are changing subject, then no correlation with each other. 
Use facial expression, minds and body language, that helps greatly. Important, smile in, if you're in doubt. Learn a few signs. Here are a few given examples. Teach them finger spelling, Robert. So I can't do it on this small screen, sorry. Um, but deaf people, they use English um, words, but it's not in the not in the way we use ours. Like if I say good morning to someone, I say, good morning, Helen, how are you today? But deaf people, they'll say, uh, if I ask somebody's name, I say, hello, what's your name? But for a deaf person, they'll say, name mine is Robert. So it's usually the subject first you talk about to a deaf person, they know you're talking about that particular thing. There are a few live apps such as Sign BSL and BSL Education that can be downloaded free from apps. They're good because they're live. They're not just pictures you see as one step, but they're actually live. You see a person behind the screen actually signing the whole process of sign language. There are also a few websites that you can learn from. And that one of them is National Deaf Children Society. They've got a few good links where you can learn British Sign Language. And also the School Sign Language uh, dot com they're quite good as well because they, they're mostly live and also we found in the deaf community mate crime sometimes leads to hate crime sometimes you get somebody who hasn't got much money but they know a deaf person got very good benefits they've got laptops and they seem to make friends with them so they can use that facility and when that uh, deaf person starts to withdraw that hate crime starts to come in so that real friendship is not there is it's kind of using a deaf person. So I think that's it for me. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Robert. That was really, really interesting. Um, really fascinating to hear more insight uh, about what the deaf community is facing and also those links um, and practical things that, that we can that we can do and follow up are really really useful um, so what we might try and do actually is share some of those links to those websites and to those apps that you were talking about um, and, and pop those out on our social media when we're resharing this event so thank you very much that's that's really brilliant oh I forgot one thing um we are going to try and uh, do an online basic British Sign Language through Zoom. So keep an eye on this space. Brilliant. That's really good to know. Thank you. That's really, really useful. And I'm sure that we'll all help to promote that across all of our various channels when that goes live. OK, so I'm going to hand you over to our next speaker now. We have Jill Curry from the Berry Blind Society. Thanks, Jill. Oh, you're on mute at the moment, Jill. <laughs> Somebody had to do it. Sorry. Hi, my name is Jill Curry. I work for the Blind Society. I'm an early intervention officer uh, where I and my team actually um, diagnose people when they're first diagnosed with a sight loss. So we do an assessment. We assess exactly what the needs are, uh, refer them on to the low visual aid clinic if they need that sort of assistance um, we have we've been going since 1922 so next year is our centenary um, obviously we've not been doing this particular roles for 100 years nearly um, but we have been doing it since the 90s we have a contract with Berry Council so we have uh, we are the century team for Berry for Eyes I don't know if everybody's aware of that um, so as long as you come under Berry for council tax, you can come to us with any issue uh, for sight loss. doesn't matter whether it's temporary, permanent. Um, that, and that's basically, you know, we deal with anybody with a sight loss from just needing a bit of advice to a full assessment, mobility assessment, long cane training. Um, we also uh, found that in recent times, um, and one of the main issues we find that if you have um, a vision impairment and with COVID and you're out and about is people aren't, they're not aware because if you don't, sorry, if you don't use an aid as a long cane or a guide dog, people are a bit ignorant. 
So you, you can't always see if they're keeping the right space, the two meters in between. People can be abusive in that way. We, we're encouraging our, all our members or anybody with a sight loss to use um, the long cane or the symbol cane um, because obviously that makes it obvious that you have something wrong with your eyes. Although saying that, I'm a long cane user. I'm vision impaired myself, have been a long time, sight's deteriorated over the years. Um, and I find that the majority of people do move out of the way, but there's always one that says, you don't look blind. And you think, well, you don't, you look normal. For, to me, what's normal? <laughs> Um, it's very difficult and you have, to, you have to explain over again that although I'm using long cane and I might be registered blind I have got some sight and that's a difficulty I think it's the ignorance of a lot of people I'm not saying everybody's like that but that's where some of the hate crime comes in it makes you very nervous one example was when I um, just started to use a long cane it was the second time I used a cane I was in K Gardens in Bury. And this group of young boys, want better words, um, walking past and made some sarcastic remark. And I thought, ooh, they're talking about me. Yes, I think they are. And I carried on walking and then they're going, you don't, what are you using that for? You're not blind. And I thought, oh, they are talking about me. And I started to shake a little bit and I thought, I was getting quite cross and a bit upset. Now, I'm not normally a a stressful person but I carried on to the Metrolink and I got on the Metrolink and I could hear them laughing and laughing and sneering and I thought if I wasn't quite strong-willed that could lack, knock my confidence completely and it did for a while I have to say but then I thought no they're not going to beat me I've got to get on and do it and I just the next time I walked through there I just walked with the long cane and I thought if anybody's going to say anything I'm going to say something I was ready for them but nobody said anything so I was fine but that can happen in a lot of cases especially like I know we can't do it at the moment but if you go into a bar or a cafe and people um, don't always move out the way uh, you don't expect them all to you just even if they tell you where the seat is it can be useful. They don't have to grab your arm, which is an experience that's not very nice when somebody says, oh, sit here and dump you in a seat. You think, oh, what are you doing to me? <laughs> it's very embarrassing. Um, the other one, another um, scenario is um, when if you're with somebody, they always ask the other person, what do they take sugar in the tea? Do they take sugar in the coffee? And then you might turn around and go, well, actually, I do. And I can speak. You know, it's my eyes are affected, nothing else. Although we do have a lot of dual member, um, members as well. So they've got deaf and um, sight problems. Um, but generally, I think that COVID has not helped. It's lacked the confidence. And we're trying to encourage people to go out for a walk. But when people aren't aware of how far people can actually see, that's one of the big issues. It's like getting on a bus. Not that we do it much these days, but if you don't have a symbol cane or a long cane, they don't know. You might have a bus pass, a concessionary bus pass, but they don't know how far you can see or what, you, or what your disability is, basically. So the bus driver can be a little bit um, abusive as well. It's just that knowledge of a concessionary bus pass can mean any disability. But if you're carrying an aid that can assist, that can help yourself. So we're, as I say, we're encouraging people to use the aids. Um, on a discrimination part of employment, um, I can experience that. I got made redundant about nine years ago um, and trying to get a job was quite crazy. Everything was done online, which wasn't good if you don't have the technology at home. Um, I um, went to the job centre uh, like everybody does, they gave me forms to sign, which were couldn't even see them. Uh, I expected to sign on a line that you couldn't see. They didn't have any understanding. When you asked to see the disabled officer, it was about two months before I could see them, which was ridiculous. Anyway, um, I said I need further help. They referred me to another uh, RIB, a massive charity. I got some help with my, C my, my CV. And... Um, Basically, when I was sending my CVs out, because I put my disability in my age, 
it went completely against me. It was crazy. And I pro we proved it because I took my disability off and my age and I got three interviews within a fortnight. And I know that's wrong, but um, like uh, Robert said, you can get access to work if you do get a job. And I've just experienced that again with COVID. I've done the same thing, got some equipment to use at home. And I have to say, it's so much easier when when the access, when you know what's there and it's just making people aware of what the services are out there. Um, uh, as a society in general, we are trying to encourage people to either use Zoom, um, you, we're doing phone calls on a regular basis. Uh, it's just trying to make them aware that they're not on their own, they're not isolated and encouraging them to go out. And if somebody questions why they're out, you know, just say, well, I need exercise as well as anybody else. You know, why should you, why should sighted people be uh, different to us? Um, it's like going in a supermarket. Sometimes if you use a long cane, you get put to the front of the queue. You can hear all the abuse at the back going, why are they, why are they being pushed to the front? Sometimes it's so we can get the help, but people don't understand that everybody's in their own little bubble at the moment. So it's hard to understand. Um, also, we do actually do offer visual awareness training. So if anybody, any family, friends, organisations that want any vision impaired awareness training, we can, the society can offer that as a service. Um, it's just to make it's just to make people aware that um, we are here to help at the end of the day. Uh, we have a lot of information on our website as well. Um, we are trying to set up some new groups because obviously our our groups that were existing are um, actually uh, obviously not non-existent at the moment because we're not allowed we're not allowed to have groups in the society at the moment because we were a very uh, close community, um, touchy feely, you know, coming into the drop dropping centre. Um, but obviously, that's very restricted at the moment. But we are going to encourage that once lockdowns lifted, hopefully, um, and also. Um, We've been involved with the hate crime, should I said that at the beginning, sorry. We have been involved with the hate crime for a few years now. And um, it was interesting because one of the last year we did um, what we call a puppy game and it was with the sim glasses, sim simulation glasses. So it gave the public an idea of what that five or six eye conditions were like to do an actual puppy game, just hook a puppy. And it was quite interesting, but it's a shame we can't do it this year. Um, I think I'm probably going over my time now. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but to, to finish, yeah, just um, people just be a bit more thoughtful. Um, everybody's in the same situation. We've all got mental, well, I hate that word, mental, mental health issues, but we all have a, a level of that. And just be a bit more considerate and kind, whether whatever the disability is, whether it's sight, hearing, you know, in a wheelchair, just, just be more considerate. Okay. Thank you very much, Jill. Um, there's a kind of a theme coming out, isn't there, of a lot of these um, conversations around the importance of, of kindness and compassion, treating other people as equals. I think that's really um, a really, really key thing that, that is, is relevant and important to all of us. So thank you very much, Jill. That was some really, really interesting insight um, into those particular challenges. So to follow up, I'd now like to um, introduce our next speaker, who's Anthony Goff. Um, and Anthony Goff works with um, Engage to Stage, who are a visually impaired theatre company, who um, in normal time are based uh, with us at the Met, but have been doing some really exciting work online with their communities, both locally in Bury and across the rest of the country. They're taking over the world. Over <laughs> to you, Anthony. Oh, well, that was an awesome introduction, I might, I might say. Um, yeah, um, so I'm Anthony Goff. I'm a director at Engage to Stage CIC. We've been going now since 2018, but we formally became a CIC in September last year. Um, so following on really from a lot of what, what Jill was saying really, I wanted to um, talk to you about um, a personal experience I had a couple of years ago. Um, I, was, I was in Manchester and I was using my symbol cane 
and a group of a group of youths started well shouting at me um being quite um intimidating um verbally um and and that hasn't just happened to me once it's happened to me one or two times and on one occasion um someone did actually um steal my mobile phone um and that kind of um attack on on somebody you know i've i want to make people aware of how that makes somebody feel you know it it really does um strip back um your of of everything of, of what you are and it can i mean at the time i wasn't in a great place mentally and it can really have a devastating effect i mean luckily I have such a great family, such great friends, such a brilliant support network, but not everybody has. I mean, the statistics speak for themselves. 40% of, of people who are the victims of a disability hate crime don't, don't even get to the stage where they report it to the police. So for me, you know, such an important thing about this is being able to, one, identify when you are the victim of a hate crime and when you are you know reach out to people speak to people speak to your family your friends if if it's somebody um the the um I'm, I'm sure we can um have um helplines put in the put in the description as well um of, of people that you can speak to even if on an anonymous basis you want to speak to someone because that is so important that you talk um the other thing um is for me, um, being a, a simple cane user, I've had a quite an interesting um, past, I suppose, of, of using a simple cane, because what those experiences did is they made me not want to use them, and that then becomes a problem, because if you're a visually impaired person and you have an aid and you're supporting on that aid. Uh, to then not want to go out and use that aid, it's restricting you as an individual. And I mean, for a time, um, I, I got a bit annoyed with myself because I um, I was stopping using my cane, which you know is something I shouldn't have done. It's something I wish I hadn't have done. But it it took a while. It took a while to build that confidence back up and get back out there. So, you know, uh, that's one of the things I'd say to people, identify if, if you feel you've been a victim of a hate crime, try and reach out to somebody, try and report it, whether it is to the police, because, you know, let's, let's make an impact on those statistics because they're, they're rubbish, they really are. Um, as, a, as an organisation um, engaged to stage, that's what we want to do. It's in it's in our name. We want to engage with people, and it's not just visually impaired people we work with. A lot of our members um, are sighted. Around seventy percent are visually impaired. Around thirty percent are sighted, and that that group of sighted individuals that work alongside us is so important because it builds bridges between communities. It raises awareness. It increases understanding across a variety of different communities, and that is what we're all about you know and and i think sometimes the arts and the theater they get you know they get a kick in sometimes but they're so important so important in terms of self-expression and right the way through my life actually it's it's one of the things that have got me it's got me through a lot of the a lot of the barriers that i've faced being able to be expressive, being able to tell my story. Um, I probably wouldn't have been able to do that if I hadn't gone gone through that process. So it's vitally important for, for confidence. And the other thing I, I want to say is being a face group, we want to encourage people to, when hopefully when all of this COVID's over and, you know, we can get back into the theatre because I'm so looking forward to getting back into the studio. When we can do that, we want people to be 
able to come and to be able to join in and participate and enjoy the theatre and enjoy being able to express themselves and sometimes um it is it i won't say what i want to say <laughs> because i know i know we're um i know we're online but um it really does make you cross when when you're trying to encourage people to to come out and to and to engage and then you know something like that happens to someone like like what happened to me and it is it's difficult and it's and it's really it can be so upsetting and i think people don't always realize how upsetting it can be um so so yeah i just wanted to i just wanted to say that and again you know let's let's make those statistics better so that we're so that everybody is is living in a better place and hopefully after covid we're all you know have a better mindset and we're all more mindful of one what we say what we do how to how to speak to people and just be be kind to people you know i'd implore people just you know if you, if you don't have anything nice to say don't say anything at all you know um contribute to to a positive society and a a positive way of life for everybody when when all of this is over because we've all been through so much over the past two years now and and right the way through right the way through covid and it's it is such an isolating time so wouldn't it be wouldn't it be a good positive step step and a positive change to come out of this you know with that you know and take and take that forward that you know we can we can be better and i think we could all we could all be better and i think it's just a case of awareness being able to speak to people learning i'm learning all of the time you know visually impaired people often find it difficult to communicate as it is especially in large groups so so be be aware of be aware of that you know um don't come into the room wanting to be confrontational with with people um take a step back take a take a minute compose yourself and and yeah be try and contribute positively to the to the conversation and i think that's what hopefully will come out of this um and um and yeah i'm, I'm hoping that that engage to stage um will be back We'll be back soon at the at the Met Theatre, and I'm really looking forward to it. So um, that was that was me. Um... Thanks very much, Anthony. That was that was brilliant. Um, really lovely. Again, positive. Really inspirational words. But a big thanks as well for for also sharing that personal experience as well. It's really really valuable for for us and and for anybody who's who's watching with us to be able to hear the the actual real life impact um that an event like that can have on somebody so um thank you we really really appreciate that um so you you've got a little bit of me talking now um i'm just going to talk a little bit about um another group that is very very important to the work that we're doing within the creative case group and within this project uh, and that is a company called met express um, Met Express are uh, the Met's in-house learning disabled theatre company um, and I don't want to um, really speak on behalf of them um, because I'm not a learning disabled person myself. Um, I'm just here to, to pass on the message of, of what they wanted to communicate and contribute to this conversation this afternoon but unfortunately they weren't able to be with us in person. In normal times, um, there are around 30 individuals who attend Met Express on a weekly basis across two evening workshops. Um, they work on a variety of different shows that are performed throughout the year um, and have put on amazing performances in the past that have been really well received and, and massively acclaimed by their audiences. At the moment, the group's meeting on Zoom as it has been since um, last sort of spring summer 
And the last piece of work that they produced was a brilliant advent calendar project that went live um, in December in the run up to Christmas, where each day they released um, a brand new little video of one of the members performing their own piece of drama to camera. Um, so it's a huge amount of material, a huge amount of hard work that went into that. And it was really great to enable people to see um, a little bit, have a bit of an insight into the work that had gone on with this group um, during that lockdown period. So as part of this project that we're working on, Met Express are, uh, are just about to start on a filmmaking project. And this project is gonna focus on sharing the positive stories that um, our group have chosen to talk about regarding their skills, their abilities and their achievements. The group chose to take a very positive viewpoint on this project, even though it is underpinned by this message about um, talking about hate crime and, and improving cohesion. What they wanted to do was to communicate to people the contribution that disabled and learning disabled people make to society. And that really picks up on a key issue that learning disabled people face within our society, as the negative attention that these individuals sometimes receive can be bound up in that notion that they are incapable and not able to fight back. Um, a report that was published back in 2018 showed that learning disabled people have been particularly susceptible to crimes like fraud and a horrible practice called cuckooing, which is the practice of taking over somebody's property for the purpose of criminal activity. Now, these crimes often really, really go under the radar um, and they exist in tandem with more sort of high profile and more obviously uh, violent crimes. And the Foundation for People with Learning Disabilities uh, published a report in 2017 that stated that learning dis disability hate crime is both underreported and then mismanaged. And I think both Anthony and Robert have picked up on this um, in their pieces today, that often the people who are on the end of those um, hate crimes, those experiences, people that are being targeted, don't really realise that that is what they're actually facing. There's a um, there's a perception, particularly within the learning disabled community, that oh, well, that's just what happens and that it's in some way something to be expected, which is an awful thing to think of um, when, when you start to consider that people's lives are being so affected by this. Discrimination against learning disabled or neurodiverse people also goes beyond those, those criminal acts into the wider society as a result of those perceptions and that stigma that individuals are not capable. The British Attitude Survey back in 2017 showed that just under a third of people in Britain thought that learning disabled people were not as productive as those that were non-disabled. And those attitudes have a massive knock on effect in causing learning, learning disabled people to face problems accessing health care, accessing housing, education, employment and social activities. And this can start right the way from um, the very early years of a person's life. So in 2017 to 18, um, the ONS and NHS Digital reported that only 6% of adults with a learning disability known to their local authority were in paid employment in England. And that's compared to 76% of people within the general population aged 16 to 64. And children with special educational needs are twice as likely to be bullied regularly than children with no SEN, which is a really stark thing to think about and again to to consider that that often this those experiences in childhood add into that perception that oh it is just something that happens to have that thread running through somebody's life is is a really heartbreaking thing to think but there are projects of course and approaches that help to try and end these negative experiences um one of the most powerful of these is self-advocacy and self-advocacy projects at the moment uh, are enabling, uh, enabling learning disabled people to address these issues themselves and learn about their rights. 
that's helping learning disabled people to know what behaviour or attitudes towards them should be reported or challenged. And that's really important because there's a learning process that goes on within there, which is so helpful towards um, learning disabled people. And that then provides them with that sense of empowerment that means that they can feel like they, they're able to stand up for themselves and challenge that behaviour. MENCAP have also observed that education and contact-based approaches for the non-disabled community are absolutely key. And that's all about increasing the visibility of learning disabled people and enabling non-disabled people to see learning disabled people within society, enabling them to um, take part in activities together, to work together, as well as doing the educational stuff and learning about the nature of different learning disabilities. Education for those that deliver services is also really, really important. Um, and it's, it's really a, a developing thing to, to make sure that people that are working in services that come into contact with learning disabled people, and let's face it, that, that's everywhere, um, need to undertake a little bit more training and education in terms of um, that awareness of the different issues that learning disabled people face. Um, people going on those uh, on that sort of training and taking part in that education are able to then do those two really important things, which is to protect learning disabled people, but also to empower them at the same time. And it's a real balancing act um, in order to, to make a really positive impact there to make sure that um, people are both protected from harm um, and given the opportunity to live in a, in a comfortable and safe environment, but also empowered and unable to, um, to challenge poor behaviour, to fight for their own rights and to know um, when things are happening around them are not acceptable. Um, so we really hope that Met Express can continue to be part of this conversation and that the work that our um, members who all have a wide, wide variety of different learning disabilities are able to share their experiences, to share their skills, to share their abilities and their achievements with the wider world to help to educate and to help improve the visibility of that community as well. Um, so we've done really well here. We're, we're heading up towards um, two o'clock really um, quite rapidly. I think we've just got time um, for me to ask a question, an open question to the group that are um, assembled with us today. Um, uh, and I'm going to just press that button here so that it appears in the chat so that the guys who are with us on the call can read it as well as uh, listening to me. I'm just wondering whether anybody has any really good examples of projects or activities that have had a positive outcome for social or cultural cohesion in the past. Um, could I speak? Of course, Robert, go for it. I mean, many years ago, with my disability, um, I was going through a tough phase and I went to the doctors and someone said to me, before you go to doctors, ask the support, um, mental health support, not tablets. So I seen my doctor and I told him I was there and I wanted uh, mental health support. I didn't like saying that because you've got the uh, Presswich Hospital up the road and it was a lot of stress that was going into not mental health, but actually they're both the same. So I got that support to about three, four, 10 week sessions with a deaf um, a mental health support. And it was really good. It was, it was putting all my feelings and thoughts onto the table. And we were both sharing which words were affecting me, which I could study and study myself. It transformed my life because it put words to my feelings, which I actually didn't know what to put in. But when I went to the mental health course, they helped me to put my feelings into words and work on it. And it transformed my life. So the Deaf Centre, I knew there was a lot of problems. And so I asked the, one of the guys from mental health support to come to the Deaf Centre to the social event, social afternoon, social evening. 
So as soon as he said mental health, half the room turned around and walked off because they associated it with uh, Presswich Hospital. So he sat them down and he said, mental health is a form of stress levels that people have and they can't cope. So we started talking about stress levels. Um, when he broke it down from mental health to a person having lots of stress because of life itself and their disability, practically the whole center people went for support. Um, six months, a year later, a lot of the clients started to understand. And then this day, because I've been here such a long time, they've moved on to prominent positions in different deaf clubs and different associations. One, one hit me where a deaf person had a learning difficulty. Everybody used to bother him. One day when he went to a mental health support, six months later, someone bothered him and he turned around and says, I'm having my lunch at the moment. I'll see you after lunch. And the transformation, you know, what these services can do outside is phenomenal, really. So it's there, it's free in America, certain places in the world, you've got to pay for it. But while it's here, use it um, for the best of your interest. You don't have to share it with anybody, you just go get that real support. It transformed me, it transformed a lot of people I know and they've moved on. I think that's answered your question. Thank you very much. That's really, um, I think that's a, the, a great message, a great thing to remind people of really, isn't it? Um, that, that that support is available and and uh, all of the, the organisations that are um, assembled today do a really good job of helping to um, communicate that and helping to improve the access to those services. So, so thanks for that, Robert. Um, does anybody else have any, any quick final thoughts that they want to, to share? Um, can I just um, can I just say just following on from that from from a mental health perspective, you know, having something that you're passionate about or a group that you can go to, and it doesn't have to be performing arts because not everybody wants to be centre stage in the spotlight, but it could be learning a new language, or it could be painting or anything poetry. If you can get your thoughts and feelings down into words you know just echoing on from from what Robert was saying it's the the transformation that it can make is it's amazing and the transformation that I've seen in people members of engaged the stage that have come along um has been has been amazing so so yeah I just wanted to echo really what what Robert was saying thanks Anthony that's that's really great um really important to highlight. Um, if there are no further um, additions, then I will, um, I'll do the little winding up thing, shall I? So uh, I just want to give a big thank you to everyone who um, has joined us and spoken today. Um, thank you to Councillor Jane Black, who opened the event for us. Thanks to Aisha, thanks to Robert, thanks to Anthony, and thanks to Jill. Um, thanks to um, our team from the Met who've been um, lurking on the call as well. We've had Sophie um, and Sam with us today, helping out behind the scenes. Um, so this is just the starting point of um, what is going to be a year long project that is supported through the hate crime awareness pot of money that, that we received at the beginning of the year. Um, we're working together as a creative case group to help it, to try and explore how uh, arts and cultural activities can help to do some of this work that we've talked about today around helping to um, educate and improve awareness of different um, communities within our local community and society. And we're going to be focusing really on, on children and young people uh, for that. So later on in the year, 
we're really hoping, fingers crossed, that once we're able to go back to seeing each other live face to face, that we're going to be able to hold two events. Um, one we're aiming to be in the summertime and one we're hoping to hold in the autumn. And these events are going to be uh, an opportunity for um, young people from pri local primary schools and hopefully from um, colleges as well to come together to take part in some um, brilliant arts and cultural activities that are inspired by the different communities that we have around the table and with us in Bury. Uh, so we've got a whole range of really exciting fun ideas that are already um, appearing. Everyone's already working really hard on what those activities are going to be. So we're really, really looking forward to being able to um, welcome children and young people back into the Met, uh, hopefully in the summer and, and in the autumn to take part in those activities to help with exactly this job of improving and increasing the awareness that people have of our range of communities that make up the brilliant patchwork that Berry is and to build um, to really help to empower those young people to be advocates for diversity in the future to try and end the hate crime and discrimination that we've talked about here today. Thank you very much everybody for joining us and we look forward to hopefully seeing you later on in the year.